Hello, everybody. I'm a school teacher and a school principal, and uh, I've done this job for more than 20 years. Now, in those 20 years, there's one thing that I've learned, and it is that no matter what I'm trying to teach or who I'm trying to teach it to, there's always someone in every class a bit smarter than me. Now, this was evident a couple of weeks ago. I was on a bushwalk in the National Park with a group of seven-year-olds, and uh, I thought I'd spotted a Lancaster bomber in the sky. I said to the children, stop, everybody, look, it's a Lancaster bomber. One little boy popped his hand up and said, Gavin, I think you'll find that's a C-19 Globemaster III. You can tell by the shape of the engines. And what that said to me was, this little boy had a niche, he had a forte, he had a passion. And my job as the teacher was to take heed of that, observe it and harness it, and build the curriculum around him, putting him at the center of his learning. Essentially taking the teacher away from the, the forefront and putting the child at the center of their own learning. Now, a few years ago, I was uh, administering a NAPLAN test, which is the standard eye test of Australia. I was walking down the aisles, I gazed over a little boy's shoulder, and tears were falling from his eyes onto the test paper. It was becoming very soggy and sodden, it was a very sad moment. He finished the test, and later on, I was thinking about those tears and, and where they came from. And I came up with the conclusion that when our policymakers and our politicians make new legislation or rules around rankings and comparing our students and comparing our schools, they end up as tears falling from a nine-year-old boy's eyes onto a test paper. And for me, that is not education. And I feel that as adults and as teachers, we need to stop thinking of our students or our children as empty vessels waiting to be filled up. When we look at the word education in Latin, go back to its etymology, it had two meanings. One meaning to train or to mold our students, but the other meaning to guide or to lead. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you went to a school similar to mine. We sat in rows in silence. Mr. Johnson was at the front with his, uh, you know, his diagram on plate tectonics. We highlighted the key words, and if we remembered everything by Friday, well, that was a great A. Now, when we only focus on the academics, we miss out on the essential skills, such as love, empathy, compassion, understanding. All of these things are missed. And when we break it down, school is a place where you should be able to develop the confidence to try, but the resilience to fail. But the question is, how do we get there? How do we marry and mash academics and essential skills? Well, for me as a Montessori teacher, the answer is simple. It's to do with the classroom, or what we call the prepared environment. Simple adaptations such as allowing children to sit where they wish, sit with whom they want, or represent their research in a way that suits them, is simple. Small changes that would develop independence, a core skill going forward, and confidence. Now, this was proven to me a few weeks ago. I was teaching kindergarten, and I approached three girls. They were doing a project, and I said, hey, girls, it's time for your science lesson. One six-year-old turned to me and said, Gavin, we're really busy today. Do you mind if we do it tomorrow? And to me, that was a success. She told the principal, hey, go away, we're busy, and I left. Now, thinking of kindergarten, a child today in kindergarten in Australia will graduate 2032, 12 years from now. Who knows what the world would look like in 12 years? We do know what it looked like 12 years ago, in 2008. There was no Tesla cars on the road, the iPhone had just been released, and Google Maps was a figment of someone's imagination. So who knows what content our children are going to need in 2032? We don't, but we do know what skills they will need. They'll need love, empathy, compassion, understanding, resilience. All of these skills are extremely important. Now, 2020 was a year of the pandemic and still is, and we told our children, I'm sorry, school is closed. You have to leave. Classes are going to be done remotely. Take your laptop home to your bedroom. You're going to have to survive without a teacher, and recess is canceled indefinitely. Now, we all worried our children were going to struggle, they were going to suffer, but they didn't. They went home, they got to their bedrooms, and they thrived. And they proved to us they were adaptable. They could adapt to change, they were resilient, they could manage their time. They proved to us that executive functioning is not just for executives. It sits in every classroom in the world. Now, interestingly, 70% of everything you ever learned was in before you were seven years old. 70%. Same with our children. And interestingly enough, in Australia, the average child will spend about 140 hours at school per month compared to 540 at home. It's a big difference. And why am I telling you these statistics? I'm telling you them because it tells us that learning is not confined to the classroom. Learning takes place everywhere, at home, at school, in the park, in the car. 
And as adults, what we can actually do is think about that. And small changes at home, such as allowing your child to pack their own bag, make their own lunch, choose their own clothes, may seem small. And yes, your son might forget his hat on a sunny day and have to miss recess. He might make a baked bean and you know, tomato sauce sandwich for lunch, or you know, miss his homework. But the reality being that from those mistakes will come great avenues of learning. And it's that learning that we want to cultivate. Now, Aristotle said that educating the mind without educating the heart was no education at all. And I completely concur. And this was proven to me two years ago. I was on a school tour at my school. I had several parents on a school tour. And at the end of that tour, um, there was one mum who hung behind. And she stayed behind and she said, Gavin, look, I'm in a bit of a pickle. My son actually attends another school. He's struggling really badly and spends most of his time with his head on the table, hoping that something will go in his ears. Now, he was eight. Now, I was heartbroken. I said, we don't have any space. We're full, but bring him in the morning, and we'll see what we can do. So I walked onto the playground, as the principal does, and I met him. There he was, standing there. I took his hand and said, come on, let's go have a look at your new classroom. Now, he wasn't moving. His hand was all clammy and wet with nervousness, and he was shaking like a leaf. I didn't know what to do at that point. Around the door popped a seven-year-old boy, Oliver. He said, Gavin, is this Oscar? I said, sure is. He came over, he threw me out the way. He took little Oscar's hand, and he said to Oscar, come on, let me show you where you put your bag. And off they went to the classroom. Now, intrigued at this, I followed him. I went to the classroom, I popped my head around the door to see what was going on. As they walked through the room, another little boy popped out of his seat. And he said, if Oliver's busy, then I'll be your friend. And I thought, this school is doing everything that I wanted. This is learning, this is life. I closed the door and I left. And I thought about Oliver. Now, no matter what Oliver gets out of my school in his seven years, he'll be the boy in high school who sits with a lonely child on the playground. He'll be the man in the office who will call out inequality and injustice. And he will be the leader that we all crave for today in our society. There's a little bit of Oliver in every child in the world. We just need to let them discover it. And that is how education can save the world. Thank you very much.